No, this is Angela again, and today I only want to read the first chapter of Steps to Personal Revival. As uh, we will have some holidays, and perhaps it will help you to come a bit deeper in into this book. And before I begin, I want to pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for the possibility to share the good news about you, what you have done for us. I ask you, bless this reading. Give me and all the listeners the Holy Spirit that we can understand what you want us to say and lead us into all truth. And let us, let us be happy in you because you are loving us. This I pray in the almighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> this is chapter one. Jesus' most precious gift. Oops. Now oh, the picture is gone, just to find it again. Wait a moment. Can't see the picture. I have to go down here. Yes, now I can see. Uh, Jesus' most precious gift. What did Jesus teach about the Holy Spirit? Are you acquainted with Jesus' most powerful message? And I think I will make the text a bit bigger. I can't. Yes, now it is coming. That you also are able to read together with me in case of you don't understand my bit strange accent. A few of the first personal testimonies. Back to our first love. A sister wrote to me, my friend and I care currently studying the 40 days book for the third time, alternating with the booklet Steps to Personal Revival. Before we discovered this material, our faith experience and prayer wasn't, prayer life wasn't what it had once been. We longed to find our first love again. We have found it. We thank God with our whole hearts. It is so wonderful how our loving God answers prayers and that he reveals how his spirit is working on us and on people we are praying for. Jesus entered our lives. Another person wrote about these books. They have become a great and long-awaited blessing in my life. Just like many other church members and a sister from our church have experienced Something was always missing in our faith experience. And now we have had the privilege of experiencing how Jesus has entered our lives and has begun to change us. He is still working on us and step by step is drawing us closer to him. Did Jesus' disciples ask themselves, how can Jesus exercise such a great influence? Was it connected with his prayer life? That is why they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus responded to the request. His prayer lesson in Luke 11, 1 to 13 has three parts. The Lord's Prayer, the parable of the friend coming at midnight, midnight and as a climax, the continual request for the Holy Spirit. In the parable, verses 5 to 8, visitors arrive at a man's home late in the evening, and he has nothing to serve them. Because of his need, he immediately goes to his neighbor. He explains to him that he has nothing and asks for bread. He continues to ask until he finally receives the bread. Now he has bread, the bread of life. Now he can share with his guests. We learn here that we have to come to Jesus so that we can share with other people. When we want to pass on the bread of life, then we often realize that we have nothing at all. Now Jesus links this parable, this problem, I have nothing, with a request for the Holy Spirit, Spirit by saying, Therefore, I say to you, ask, and it will be given you. Luke 11, verse 9, then follows. Jesus' special appeal, therefore ask for the Holy Spirit. 
There is a particular Bible passage in which Jesus emphatically commands us to ask for the Holy Spirit. I know of no other passage where Jesus so lovingly urged us to take something to heart. These verses are found in his lesson on prayer in Luke chapter 11. There he emphasized ten times that we should ask for the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, 9 to 13, as reads after the New King James Version, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from another fa from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks him for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. In these few, few verses, Jesus used the verb ask six times. Then he replaced ask and emphasized it with seek two times, an action and two more times with knock, also an action word. Doesn't he clearly show us that we have to take action in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the last ask is used in the continuous tense in Greek. That means that we aren't to ask only once, but rather to ask continuously. Here Jesus not only makes asking a matter of urgency, but implores us to ask continually. Certainly he also wants to awaken our desire for the Holy Spirit with this heartfelt invitation. This urgent invitation shows us Jesus' conviction that we would be missing something crucial if we don't continually ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He was clearly calling our attention to the fact that we absolutely need the Holy Spirit. In this way, he wants us to continually receive the rich blessings of the Holy Spirit. In Christ Object Lessons, it says, God does not say, ask once and you shall receive. He bids us ask to unwaringly persist in prayer. The persistent asking brings the petitioner into a more earnest attitude and gives him an increased desire to receive the things for which he asks. Jesus then gave three examples which show behavior that is unimaginable even for sinful human fathers. He wanted to show us that it is even more unimaginable that our Heavenly Father wouldn't give us the Holy Spirit when we ask. Jesus wants us to be sure that we will receive the Holy Spirit when we ask in the appropriate way. With this promise and other promises, we can ask in faith and know that we have already received what we requested. You can read 1 John 5, verse 14 and 15, and more information about it in chapter 5. This special invitation shows us that according to Jesus, something essential is missing when we don't persistently ask for the Holy Spirit. He draws it to our attention that we absolutely need the Holy Spirit. He wants us to continually experience the rich blessings of the Holy Spirit. This part of his lesson on prayer is a unique process. The Holy Spirit is God's greatest gift, the gift which brings all the other gifts with it. This was Jesus' crowning gift to his disciples and clear proof of his love. I think we can understand that such a valuable gift wouldn't be pushed on someone. It is only given to those who express their desire for this gift and appreciate it. It will be given to those who have surrendered their lives 
to Jesus. He will be given to those who live in continual commitment. John 15, verse 4 to 5. Commitment is expressed by a yearning for God, whoever thirsts. Kindly of read John 7, verse 37. Trust in God. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, John 7, verse 38. Complete surrender as a result of trusting God, placing your whole life at God's disposal. Romans 12, verse 1. Following God in everything, those who obey him, Acts 5, verse 32. We confess every known sin. If we confess our sins, he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9. Give up their own way. Go God's way and do this according to God's will. Repent and be baptized. Acts 2 verse 38. Not to plan anything wrong. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Psalms 66 verse 18. Realize and admit to our great need, I have nothing. Luke 11 verse 6. Continually ask for the Holy Spirit. Luke 11 verses 9 to 13. Can't you clearly see how valuable this gift is? When you think about all these prerequisites, then you will probably find deficiencies in yourself. I have made it my habit to pray daily for a desire for the Holy Spirit in connection with John 7:37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And we can pray. I will pray now. Lord Jesus, I completely say yes to all the prerequisites for receiving the Holy Spirit. I sincerely ask that you now, today, fulfill them in me. Our wonderful God is even there for us in fulfilling the prerequisites. And I will thank our dear Lord Jesus that he is fulfilling these prerequisites in us. I will praise you, dear Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a good point to stop the listening and ponder a bit about the things we have heard. And um, there are some questions. Now I have to find the English first. I don't have it. You can find it at the end of the chapter. I continue. The Holy Spirit is the source of a fulfilled life. According to Jesus, why did he come to this earth? He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10 verse 10. Jesus wants us to experience this Holy Spirit life now and to continue it in a completely different dimension after his second coming in God's kingdom throughout eternity. And here's a little remark. It is, it is worthwhile to pray with promises. If you want to know more about this, please read chapter 4 of Steps to Personal Revival. It is really worthwhile. He also shows us that the source of a fulfilled life is the Holy Spirit. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. John 7, 30, uh, 7 until 39. Rivers of living water. Isn't that a good picture of a fulfilled life? During his life here on earth, did Jesus give us a corresponding example? We know that Mary conceived Jesus through the Holy Spirit in Matthew 1.18. We 
We know that after his baptism, he prayed, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. Luke 3.22 Under these circumstances, was it necessary and important that he receive the Holy Spirit daily? Why does he admonish us to repeatedly ask for the Holy Spirit? I quote from Ellen G. White. Morning by morning, he communicated with his Father in heaven, receiving from him daily a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is a statement in Acts of the Apostles. To the consecrated worker, there is wonderful consolation in the knowledge that even Christ, during his life on earth, sought his Father daily for fresh supplies of needed grace. Jesus indeed was an example to us in this. We have to ask ourselves, if Jesus daily needed a refreshing from the Holy Spirit, then how much more important is it for you and me? The Apostle Paul really understood Jesus' objective. In his letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul confirms in chapter 1, verse 13, that they had been sealed by the Holy Spirit when they became believers. In chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, he encourages them to be strong in the Spirit. In chapter 4, 30, he admonishes them, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And in chapter 5, 18, Paul, as an authorized apostle, calls the Ephesians and us to be filled with the Spirit or let yourselves be continuously and repeatedly filled again with the Spirit. We see that even if we received the Holy Spirit when we were born again, that we in general need a daily refreshing. Therefore, it is important for the spiritual life and growth of a Christian that they be daily filled with the Holy Spirit. Every one of us needs it. Our Sabbath school study guide says the following about Ephesians 5.18. What does it mean to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Jesus personally explained this with a synonym. A person is baptized with the Holy Spirit, Acts 1, verse 5, and the Holy Spirit has come upon them, verse 8. To be baptized means to be fully immersed in something, usually water. This involves the whole person. Baptism with the Holy Spirit means to be completely under the influence of the Holy Spirit, to be completely filled by Him. This isn't a one-time experience, but rather something that has to be continually repeated, as Paul illustrates in Ephesians 5.18b with the tense of the Greek word, fill. Jesus' farewell words and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' farewell words, he conveyed joy and hope by telling them, that the Holy Spirit would come in his place. Jesus tells the disciples something surprising in John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. But if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. A new advantage solution. Jesus told the disciples something surprising. It is your advantage that I go away. This means that the new solution that he is with us through the Holy Spirit is more advantageous than Jesus being personal present. In this way, he is not limited, but rather he can be by each person, no matter where he currently is. A personal testimony from a teacher and one of her students. When the booklet, Steps to Personal Revival from Helmut Haubey, was handed out in my home church about a year ago, I read it through very quickly. Already by reading it, I, I had more experiences with God than ever before. 
This fascinated and encouraged me. This was a bit too quick. In the booklet's appendix, I found the following suggestion. Pedagogical research has shown that it is necessary to read or listen six to ten times to a vital topic till we have thoroughly understood it. These encouraging words captivated my attention. Try it at least once. The result will convince you. I wanted to experience that, and already by the third reading, it seized me and I felt great love for our Redeemer, which I had yearned for my whole life. Within two months, I had read it through six times, and the result was worth it. It was as if I could understand what it would be like when Jesus comes close to us and we can look into his pure, kind and loving eyes. From then on, I didn't want to be without this joy in our Savior. When I woke up in the morning, I already yearned for my morning worship time in order to again, to again experience fellowship with God. And during the day, I prayed quietly that the Holy Spirit would help me with my thoughts during conversations, my example while teaching and communicating. When a child craved attention and acted accordingly, God gave me strength and wisdom to deal with it. Since then, my work days are filled with the presence of the Creator. He helps me literally in my everyday life. Since then, I pray in the morning and in between times for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It is as if you are closer to heaven and can already taste what it will be like there. While reading the booklet, the thought came to me that my students in the school should also share in this experience. I teach the 10 to 15 year olds in our Elijah Adventist School in Vorarlberg, Austria. So I prayed for God to give me opportunities. Very soon afterwards, I had one of my most wonderful experiences with how the Holy Spirit can work in young people's hearts. Now I see the booklet because I told you that there are some questions at the end of every chapter. We'll just have a look for them. It is on page 27. What word did Jesus use most often when he taught about prayer? Kindly read Luke 11, 1 to 13. The last prayer, the parable and the appeal. What problem in the parable about perseverance in prayer caused Jesus to make the appeal that we ask for the Holy Spirit? Only until this. Now I'm reading the experience or testimony of this 13-year-old ruffian and the Holy Spirit. The experience started a year before I read the booklet on the Holy Spirit. A new student came to our school and within a few days our peaceful oasis was changed into a rough scuffle room. The boy was 13 years old then. He was the biggest of all the children and correspondingly strong. Many things that had been learned during the school year and how had brought wonderful fruit seemed to disappear in a moment. Let him share it in his own words. When I came to my present school, I had no idea what awaited me. On my second day of school, I let myself get provoked, snapped, and started a fight with one of my classmates. I hit him even though he was considerably weaker than I was, berated him and never wanted to see him again. Later, I realized my mistake and apologized, just as I always had in the past. After that, I had a conversation with the headmaster. In the next months, a process started in me. It is astonishing that this process had only now started since I was a pastor's son. 
I started to spend more time with Jesus. I thought that this young person would need extra special attention. He was aware of his failure, regretted it and tried again, but he didn't have long lasting success in his own strength. At first, hardly a day would go by when he wasn't in a fight, but gradually it got better. After six months, he said, he thought it was the prayers that had brought him closer to God. In the meantime, he had started praying for strength in the morning. His fits of rage and fights became less frequent. Eleven months had now gone by since he came to our school, and we could see even more improvements. But his anger, his swearing outbursts, and his fists were permanent, burned permanently under control. It was only natural. He tried to win in his own strengths and understanding, which worked sometimes and other times not at all. Our prayers had made some achievement, but his mindset still wasn't right, and the renewing power of the Spirit was missing. What good does it do when a person sees their mistakes, tries to control their temper, and in the next moment fails again? Just at the time when I realized that I was at my wit's end, I received the booklet mentioned above. It came at just the right time. Then I realized what we were missing. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. We hadn't even asked him to help us. Since I had been touched by the message of Steps to Personal Revival, I got up my courage to ask the boy if he had ever prayed for the Holy Spirit. No, he never had. Then I tried to awaken his interest in the booklet. I didn't give it to him, though. He should really want it. And very soon he did ask for the booklet. Again, in his own words, in November two. 2012, my teacher gave me the booklet Steps to Personal Revival. I eagerly started to read it. At that time, I wasn't really acquainted with the work of the Holy Spirit. Within the first day, he had already devoured almost two chapters, and then he asked me how many times I had to read it. He immediately started to read the chapters again and wanted to do exactly what the booklet suggested, reading it six to ten times. Since then, a lot has changed. From December 2012 on, there weren't any more fists, fights or scuffles. I could hardly believe it. The boys that he had beaten up every day became his friends, and they got along harmoniously. He has completely changed. His polite and even obliging and peacefulness has taken over his aggressive nature. His classmates can confirm that God was at work. You can see the fruits every day. To God's glory, I want to mention that the boy decided to get baptized in June 2013. If that was not the Holy Spirit? I had always thought that I could manage a child and make him see reason. Patience, attention and lots of talks would do it. But it just didn't work long term. God had to intervene and taught me that it is his spirit who makes the impossible possible. Someday, when this boy is in heaven, then I will know that God brought it about. When I was at the end of my wisdom and finally understood that I could not guide him, then God started to radically work on him. It encouraged me to see that there are no hopeless cases for God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus' urgent invitation to ask for the Holy Spirit. I am sorry for the losses I have experienced because of a lack of the Holy Spirit. I need divine assistance 
so that Jesus can become greater in me. I need his help in every, every area of my life. Thank you that the Holy Spirit can change my character and can make me fit for God's kingdom. I completely surrender myself to you with all that I am and have. Thank you for accepting me and giving me your blessings. Help me to grow in knowledge about the Holy Spirit. Amen. Goes a bit on the chapter. Personal thoughts and discussion guide. The first two questions I ask, what word did Jesus use most often when he taught about prayer? Can you have a look on Luke 11, 1 to 13, the Lord's Prayer, Parable and Appeal. And what problem in the parable about persever perseverance in prayer caused Jesus to make the appeal that we ask for the Holy Spirit. And now the third one. What impresses you the most about Jesus' appeal to ask for the Holy Spirit? What can we learn from his example? We have also read that one. How is your commitment to God manifested in our daily lives? Our prayer time. And it is good to have a prayer partner. For example, husband and wife are studying this book, or brother with brother or sister with sister are studying it on a daily basis, meeting, for example, online, or via Skype or WhatsApp. I don't know what, or if we are living close together, coming together, reading some portions of this book and uh, discussing the matter, what has impressed you most, and sharing our experiences with the Holy Spirit, and then praying. Our prayer time. Contact your prayer partner and discuss the topic. Pray with your prayer partner that we will daily be aware that we need to ask by faith for the Holy Spirit in order to receive him. For thirst, that we, can, that we go more often to the living fountain for an even clearer picture of Jesus and to learn from him, how we can keep a close connection with our Heavenly Father. And I will pray once more. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you, and I thank you for this wonderful booklet which has changed my life and is changing the lives of many others. I ask you, that we daily will be aware that we need to ask by faith for the Holy Spirit in order to receive him. That we will become thirsty as a pen thirsts, uh, yearns after the living waters so that our souls are yearning after you and the Holy Spirit. That we are thirsty so we go all more often to the living fountain to you asking for the Holy Spirit. And dear Lord Jesus, we need an even clearer picture of you and to learn from you how we can keep a close connection with our Heavenly Father. I thank you for this and I ask you for forgiveness where we failed in our lives before. Let us walk in before you, that we are aware that you are loving us, that you only want to give us the best um, present, your Holy Spirit, the best gift man ever can get your Holy Spirit. And let us ask and yearn for it and yearn after a close con connection with you, a close, intimate relationship with you. This I pray in the almighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And next time is chapter 2 on page 28. What is the center of our problems? Thank you very much for listening. May the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.